Yeah, we were um, obviously at home, uh, which was why you bridge in Surrey then, and it was a buzz of excitement, lots of telephone calls, particularly coming in from international artists who were Dad's management, and Colonel Alexander, who was his manager, who was a very impressive um, ex-colonel in, in Emsa, and there was that buzz of excitement, then the cars started turning up, big black or dark blue cars, bundling us in to take us to the studio. Um, and the thing is, we, we were used to going to studios, but there was a bit more excitement about this, and we had to be as smart as possible, which in those days, believe it or not, meant wearing a school uniform, short trousers and all. But being a bit of a rebel, I decided not to wear my school tie and put on a yellow paisley tie, all things. So you'll see in the photographs in a big red book, at the end, I'm standing like that so no one can see that I've put on an illegal tie. But later on I'm caught out when Eamon and Dad are having a chat and the candid's taken, and I'm looking at them, and there's the paisley. Well, some of the guests we knew, because they were, they were friends of Dad's, or indeed our relatives, so of course we knew our grandmother, who I think was the, the first person on. Then there were um, people from Dad's past because in those days it was quite a factual programme. It took you through people's careers. And then Dick Emery, uh, who to us was Uncle Dick, um, because they'd been a double act together, or they tried to be a double act together. Um, and they went off to do summer season, and when they got there, the theatre was closed and the cast were on strike because they hadn't been paid. And my mother was one of the dancers. Um, so they turned up, stayed for two weeks, the show didn't go on, and as Mum said, both of them proposed to me during that two weeks. <laughs> he was very pleased about it. It was uh, because that being his first one, uh, being the massive star that he was at that point, well, I think he might have thought it was about time. Uh, yeah, no, he, he likes the recognition of it. Uh, I think possibly being in front of the cameras again, as you say, you've seen it, and he was definitely performing. Um, it wasn't just a, a chat, he was, he was making it a very fun show. His manager, really, uh, Laurie Mansfield, was more the, the key person because by then uh, his, his mother had passed away and uh, my mother and him had become divorced. So uh, lining up the, the people that were going to go there was more done by the office. So the secrecy bit was not very difficult. The office knew and I knew and that was about it. Um, uh, well, yeah, I was told who was going to be on, but that sort of dictated itself. I mean, there was some idea that there might have been more actors, uh, as his career had sort of shifted away from comedy somewhat and into, into acting. But as it turns out, it's definitely a comedy uh, line-up of characters, which, of course, is good television, frankly. Uh, no, he was delighted to do it. Josephine Chusen, and because she called him a little genius, he liked that very much. He was, he, he was easily flattered. Nairn Dawn Porter, I think, because that was, that was a long time ago that he made movies with her. Um, I think he was, he was very pleased that she was there. Um, he was always delighted to see Henry McGee. I mean, we called him Uncle Henry, and you know, he was a, such a lovely man. Uh, and Dad never went off Henry. They were men trains right to the end, always phoning each other. So I do remember her sitting there watching and um, people coming on as you would expect them to, with the exception of Chris Quinton, who was then a big name in Coronation Street, who decided to come on and basically turn a somersault in mid-air and land. And I think Michael just looked at him and said, did you just do that? And, and the subtext was, why? <laughs> well, he was always pleased to see Canon Ball. Um, because they'd done a couple of pantomimes together and latterly, when Dad had given up the big dangerous stunts that he used to do, um, he was producing them in slapstick routines that he discovered from the past, not just his own, but others of the great slapstick comedians as well. So uh, they got on with, they had a comedian's relationship. They liked, they liked taking the mick. Bill, Bill Kenwright's an absolutely super man. I admired him enormously. Um, Dad, Dad really loved him, um, and I think the thing with Bill is, Bill loves artists, Bill loves entertainers, you know, it's that, the, none of that's fake, he just loves it. Uh, he's an important man, it's nice to have that seal of someone like that on the show as well. He was very keen on what he would call great national institutions, you know, so he was very pleased to do it again. Um, I think he quite liked being on television as well. Maybe the publicity was nice as well, but that, that wouldn't have mattered to him very much, he, he just liked doing big events. 
Well, I think by the time he did the last one, his health was, was not what it might be. Um, he had a stroke, or his first stroke, not that long afterwards. Um, he was two shows a night in the West End. He'd been in Cinderella the Christmas before. I think he took about a week and a half off between the two and was looking at summer season coming up. But it was a resurgence. He was, uh, all the press wanted him. We were doing interviews everywhere. It was suddenly like he was, it was like it was 1968 again. You know, it, was all, it was all happening. Uh, but of course, he was a bit older than that. Um, I'm not given to slowing down. Um, working or not, he always enjoyed a night out and he hadn't stopped that either.